Um, thank you everyone for coming today. Uh, if you're an EE and you're on Teams, we have a giveaway. Um, so I guess I didn't, didn't really need the giveaway because we have a full house today. Um, so anyway, so if you're on Teams, we have a form. Just fill that out, be real quick. So welcome today uh, to the first big event of the spring semester. We have a guest speaker, uh, Dr. Peter Vetter. Round of applause, please. So Dr. Vetter is president of Bell Labs Core Research. Uh, if you don't know Bell Labs, they're a great New York, New Jersey institution. Um, they've done all sorts of amazing um, engineering and physics research in the last 50, 70 years, about 70 years, maybe more. Yeah. So uh, he leads Bell Labs. Um, and today he's going to be talking about um, their new portfolio of new mobile communication networks. Um, he's had a career of over 25 years in research leadership, mostly in fixed and mobile networks. And he and his teams have realized several world-first system de demonstrations and successfully transferred industry-leading concepts to Nokia Bell Labs business groups. Uh, he, does, he received a degree of physics engineer from Ghent University in Belgium and a PhD from the same institution in 1991. Uh, after a postdoctoral fellowship at Tohoku University in Japan, uh, he joined the research center of Alcatel, which is now Nokia, in Antwerp in 1993. And since 2009, he has been working at Bell Labs in New Jersey. Uh, he has authored over 100 international papers and presented keynotes at, and tutorials at multiple major industry events. So again, round of applause, please. Thanks, John, for this kind introduction. Um, so I, I'm excited to be here. So yes, Bell Labs is a, a historically important institute, but so is Cooper, Cooper Union. I heard so much about this uh, college here. I walked by the building. I, I know about the great history, and I'm, I'm really excited to give a talk to you. Um, I also know that you actually provide very good education. I, I, I can testify that several successful Bell Labs researchers that came from Cooper Union, and I hope we can continue on that track record. Um, I'm also excited that John introduced me, because interestingly, when I was a student, I was also a, a chairman of the Student Association, uh, so I, I can resonate with, with what he does. And we reflected a bit before this with the, the faculty on also the non-technical skills and how engagement in such things as a student association or so help you with these soft skills and, and being successful as an engineer, ultimately. Uh, so, what I want to talk to, to you about today is the journey to 6G. So, we're in the midst of a rollout of 5G mobile networks, but as Bell Labs, we have an eye for a 10-year horizon in, in front of us and doing research to prepare for those next-generation networks. But before doing that, I do want to talk a little bit about Bell Labs and uh, a great uh, place, as, as John said, with many important uh, inventions like the transistor. And I want to stop first a little bit on the transistor because actually just a few weeks ago, uh, one month ago actually, on 16th of December, we celebrated 75 years of the invention of the transistor at Bell Labs. 16th of, of December. And what do you do when it's your birthday? Yeah, you, you start reflecting a bit on the meaning of life. So we, we also did that for the transistor. Uh, what was it that made this successful invention? What is really part of also the Bell Labs research culture that led to many of the other inventions that you see on this slide? And there are five ingredients. I have five fingers, so it can't be more than five. One is go, and, and I, I want to share that also with you. If you want to be successful as an engineer, uh, go after a real problem. Don't try to solve a problem that is already solved, because yes, you may have a cool technology, but it never will reach the impact. You maybe have a, a, a research paper, but that's where it will stop. So really go after a problem that isn't solved yet. In the case of the transistor, they were going after amplifiers. 
at the time, the state-of-the-art amplifiers was with cathode uh, ray tubes, uh, so the vacuum tubes, lamp bulb-like stru structures. I mean, ask your grandparents, their, their, their radio, if you opened it, it looked like a, a bunch of lamps inside. And these things were fragile, they had a, a limited uh, lifetime, not, they, they, they consumed a lot of energy and they were bulky. And so we needed a new solution, amplifiers. But then the second ingredient is go in a non-linear way, go out of the box. The researchers did not go after, okay, I'll go again after a vacuum tube. I think of new filaments and new materials in the filaments. No, they went for solid state physics. There must be a new way in, in solid state physics. Third ingredient really have a thorough understanding of the physics, go to the fundamentals, understand the fundamental limits. What these people did, they went into the books of solid state physics, they invented a new field actually, semiconductor physics, and really understand what it means, depletion layer and all these things, and band gap and, and all that. Fourth ingredient, multidisciplinary research. It's really embracing multiple disciplines. So John Bardeen uh, is one of the in inventors. He was a theoretician. And the story goes that when he arrived at Bell Labs, they didn't find an office for him, and they put him in the same space, in the lab space, with Walter Bratton. Walter Bratton was an experimentalist, an engineer with golden hands. And it was that combination that really led to breakthrough innovations. And also their department leader, uh, William Shockley, so the, th the three of them were very successful multidisciplinary research. And broader, not only them, but actually the embracing new material sciences in those days, in 75 years ago, they made good progress in creating semiconductor uh, materials, germanium at the time, then also silicon. Uh, and then uh, un understanding that controlling the impurity level, making them really pure, but then also using these impurities to the, their advantage to create N material, P material. So multidisciplinary research, talk to the material scientists, talk to the metallurgists, and then experiment hands-on with theory. And then the fifth ingredient is go for the broader, more general applicability. They didn't stick to the amplifier alone. They realized, hey, this is a very good gate. I can switch, I can create logic with it. The start of integrated electronics later on. I, I can do a feed-forward loop. If you have an amplifier with a feed-forward, I can create uh, an oscillator. So that, that was applicable to radios. So the first transistor radios, well, amplifier for the, for the radio receiver, the oscillator, so it had all, multiple uses in the same transistor radio amplifier of the sound. So again, five ingredients go after a real hard problem, that there's a, a real need for it. Uh, go after it in a non-linear way, out, think out of the box. Go really to the fundamentals of, of the science so that you understand its limits and how it really works. Embrace a multidisciplinary approach. Talk to people outside your field and see if there's a better solution. And five, then look for the broader applicability. Semiconductor physics, people noticed that it was light sensitive, detectors, that you can harvest light, the invention of solar cells, again at, at Bell Labs. You can control the band gaps, generate light and lasers with it. So, a whole broad field of, of applications. So, a bit of a reflection because of that 75 years of uh, transistor, you can argue what is the most important invention of humanity? And people will say, yeah, it's maybe fire, maybe it's the wheel. I, I, I'd reckon, at least for the last century, it's the transistor. I mean, think of it, how it transformed our lives. Okay, then, and then this kind of research culture led to many other inventions, right? Satellite communication, uh, fiber optics, uh, also more in the soft space. I mean, Unix invented that by lab C, C++, Unix, the basis of of Linux and iOS. Um, solar cells are mentioned, and then also neural networks. Neural networks, I mean, it started with image recognition of handwritten uh, phone numbers. So that was the problem they're tr trying to solve. It was the start of, of neural networks with Jan LeCun. And yes, this kind of research, 
led to important prizes, Nobel Prizes and, and other awards, and even an Oscar and, and, and an Emmy, three Emmy Awards. But this is not the reason why you do it. It's just a, a recognition that, yes, you were going after a relevant problem and you really helped the world uh, progress. And this kind of research culture is still very much what we stand for today. Uh, we share with our researchers that we hire, and that I want to share also with you if you want to be successful, whether it's at Bell Labs or at another uh, industry lab or university lab. Okay, enough about the past. I want to talk, well, maybe a little bit more. So uh, Bell Labs, we exist almost 100 years, 2025, so stay tuned because in, in two years we will have uh, a big celebration. And, uh, but in the meantime, we are a global organization. We are in eight different locations uh, in Europe and in the, even in Asia. Our headquarters, so we are now part of Nokia, uh, known by itself for the, the handset business uh, at the time, but we are very big on network uh, infrastructure. Probably when you make a, a call or when you are at home and you're surfing on the, uh, or in your dormitory and you're surfing on the internet, very likely your uh, traffic goes through uh, network, uh, Nokia network equipment. I mean, I, for, for my part, was very early on in fiber to the home. If you have a Fios system, I was very early on in that research. Uh, and, and that makes me proud as an, as an engineer. And, and uh, again, that's what I wish every researcher, that 20 years later you can point to something. I contributed to this. I mean, that, that w is what makes us an engineer, right? Okay. Um, but in 1947, something else was invented, also at Bell Labs. I want to talk about 6G, but let's start with 0G. <laughs> Cellular networks invented at Bell Labs. And it was, uh, so you see the memo here, 20 people in CC. These are true carbon copies. Email didn't exist at the time. But the memo described uh, a solution to provide a service to any equipped vehicle in the country. And the way they did it was by reusing free sp spectral bands in small regions. They invented the hexagons, the cells, cellular networks. Now, it took many other years before we got to the mobile phones. Remember, I said any equipped vehicle in the nation. They didn't uh, Bell Labs first think of mobile handsets. This guy did this, Marty Cooper. Now, admittedly, he is not with Labs. He was with uh, Motorola. And he had the idea, the project was called uh, Phone in a Shoe. In those days, uh, there was a, a spy movie, Maxwell Smart, and he could like pick up a shoe and make a phone call. And he built this brick, uh, I think, yeah, about six pounds, 10 hours charge time, 30 minutes talk time. So it wasn't really practical, and Marty admitted that, but he said he wanted to show that it can be done, and that it's a matter of integration and miniaturization to, to get to a commercial solution. Now, his, his first uh, phone call in 73, he did from New York, and he called his competitor researcher at Bell Labs. <laughs> basically saying, ah, ah, got you. <laughs> he, he was more polite than that. Uh, so, but Bell, Bell Labs did play an important role in the further commercialization of, of uh, the phone, I mean, uh, the Bell systems. And the first commercial loan is, is another 10 years later uh, when you could have uh, mobile telephony, analog mobile telephony. Analog mobile telephony, which was, yeah, not that good quality. It was also not that scalable, and it was horrendously expensive. I mean, I, I remember when, when I was early on in, in, in university, there were people that had a, a mobile phone, but there were also a lot of fake going around. It was a status symbol. You could stop at a crossing and, and see a number of people pick up a phone in the car, but when, if you knew how much spectrum there was, some of them were not really talking. <laughs> they were uh, pretending. It was a status symbol. Now, it became more dem demo democratic with this technology. The digital phone in Europe was a GSM, here in the US CDMA, um, and Nokia played a very important role there. The very, the very first GSM call, uh, yeah, here you see the prime minister, and this was the start also of the heydays of Nokia handsets. Ask your parents. <laughs> so, uh, and then our industry has been very good at turning out a new generation of telephones, mobile telephones, 
every decade. And in, at every decade, we went after higher speeds using wider frequency bands at higher frequencies. And every generation also looked at new applications, as you see with the iconic pictures. It was not only voice, it was then also internet access, video access, and in the era of 5G, we talk about the internet of things, industrial internet of things, so connecting machines and robots. But it's not only new radio technologies that defines a new network generation, it are also new platforms new compute platforms, starting with the IBM mainframes, the VAX computers, I, I, I did my PhD on, a, on machines like that, and then the personal computers, the, the, the portables, and then in the start of, of this century, the, the, uh, the millennium, you can say, the cloud computing. And in the era of uh, 5G industrial automation, the distribution of that cloud to be closer to the end devices so that you have a closer control loop within milliseconds, whereas the central cloud that, that goes into the tens of milliseconds or hundreds of milliseconds. For human perception, 100 milliseconds is good. It's good enough. But for machines, you need really that millisecond, and hence the distributed cloud having the control functionality in the cloud, but very close to the end devices. And then also new network technologies and new network platforms. We started with the analog telephony then the, the digital uh, telephony, and then also, well, people from my generation will uh, remember circuit technology with asynchronous transfer modes, and then packet technologies in the 4G era, so Ethernet and IP. And then 5G era, cloud as a platform for network functions. We are now virtualizing network functions on the cloud. We're using principles of software-defined networking, which is a data center technology. That's how it started. Now we apply that also to networks. A side note, uh, I spent a lot of my career in fixed networks. Also in fixed networks, we went through these same generations. They were not so explicitly called out like that, but there was first analog uh, phone, then there's digital phones with uh, ISDN, and then starting the broadband. ADSL, the first success with internet, fast internet access, and then VDSL, broader, broader bands and even higher speed DSL technology, digital subscriber bands. So thanks to the success of digital si signal processing, you could increase the capacity over the twisted pair copper line. Very similar thinking of multidisciplinary re research, very similar techniques in radio applied to wireline. And we, we had cross-fertilization in our research departments to make that happen. And as you see, also the bandwidths are actually very similar generation to generation because the silicon that enabled the digital signal processing was actually very, very much the same, the same node technology, microelectronic technolo technology at the time. So every generation has a defining application also go after the real world problem. You need to set direction for the research to know what you are going to specify and what you're going to design for. But then every, and as described here, but then every generation also had the unexpected applications. At the time of the GSM that were the text messages, it was totally unexpected but enormously popular in, with my generation. And then later on also social media and that. And I, I give a beer for 5G who, who tells me what the unexpected application is going to be. But now I wanted to talk about 6G. And there are more unknowns for 6G. What, what is the defining new radio technology? What is the defining new platform? And what is the defining new application? The new radio technology, going even higher frequencies, to not millimeter wave, but terahertz, question mark. Compute platforms, is it going to be AI, the new compute platform? It's very likely. And then the new application that uh, there we see, it, it's crystal ball gazing, but we expect something around digital and physical fusion. I'm going to explain that a little bit more. So in 5G, industrial IoT, Internet of Things, we made a, did a good job at connecting humans with machines with low latency, high reliability. 
In 6G, we expect a much richer connectivity of sensors with the physical world that in real time update the physical world state into digital twin models in the, in the digital world. And also digital twin models of the humans into the, the digital world. And now why is that so important? Well, once you have these digital twin models, you can transport them. You can recreate that digital twin as a holographic representation. It can be a digital twin of ourselves, a representation of the environment that we are in, and then interact with each other as if we are in the same place. Digital twin can also be a design that we jointly work on from remote locations, and that we then transport to the location where we want to have it 3D printed, tailored to the specific need and in the place where, where you want it to be delivered. Digital twin models are also useful to analyze systems, anticipate possible failures, understand possible maintenance needs. Already today, big uh, airline, uh, sorry, air machine, Jet engine machines have already a digital twin. And these manufacturers keep a state of these jet engines in the air and they start predicting, okay, we need a maintenance then and then, and this needs, and, and this is a future also for cars. There will be a digital twin of your car and they will anticipate what spare part is needed at what time and there will be a track record of what already happened and, and so on. And so you can see how that becomes a richer and richer tool to enhance productivity and, and efficiencies. Digital twins of factory lines. Digital twins of an entire city planning for when what traffic is happening, when it's best to uh, fill the retail shops, when is the commute traffic, and, and so on. You can start optimizing a city, for instance. And then digital twins of, of ourselves. Our GP has an, an infant digital twin of us. I mean, there, there are files there of our uh, health history. Well, you can have that more in real time with all the imaging and, and our Fitbit uh, sensors and all that. So digital twin, the fusion of digital and uh, physical world. Where did you hear that before? Metaverse. So in, we, we've been pursuing that vision already for many years. And in 2021, this metaverse became a big thing. There was even a company that renamed itself. Stock market at the moment doesn't like it that much. But they had that vision of, yes, there must be something in that fusion of physical and digital worlds. And uh, they, they were very much going after the what we call the consumer met metaverse. It is very much about these uh, 3D images and virtual reality interaction and mixed, mixed reality interaction. And yeah, that is, that is cool and gimmicky, but we we already been working for many years on other types of metaverses, the metaverse of enterprises, where you have these virtual meetings, where you interact with each other, where you have these uh, spaces where you can co-design and, and then 3D printed these, these models, uh, or the metaverse of industry, the digital twin of a factory and really optimize your, your, uh, your processes. So digital physical fusion to augment our human productivity. So that is the application that we go after in uh, 6G. And for that to happen at scale, you need a new type of network. A network that is very flexible, that is scalable, that rapidly can allow us to create new capabilities, and that is also easy to use by application developers. So the platform for that is cloud. Already today, you develop applications in the cloud. Uh, and that offers you all the goodies of, uh, of flexibility and scalability. So the future of the network we also see as based on cloud, on multi-cloud. Clouds that are with the web scalers, the Amazons, the, the Microsoft and, and the likes. Data center cloud infrastructure at the communication service providers, CSP. Uh, like the Verizon, the AT&T, and T-Mobile, uh, but also uh, compute uh, cloud infrastructure on private networks. It could be a data center at the university campus, it could be a data center at uh, an enterprise, for instance, at, at Nokia. And even in future, we think there are compute capabilities at the base stations 
that we could also leverage to, to our flexible advantage. Now, when I say compute capabilities, don't think only uh, general purpose compute and multi-core processors. Think also of more specialized uh, silicon that can accelerate some of the functions. You have in your game boxes for sure a graphical processing unit engine, a GPU. Turns out that that GPU you can use also for other things, for, for AI acceleration, for instance. Or we, we figured out you could also use it for digital signal processing and create cloud ra radio. And then there's other accelerators like more specialized uh, AI accelerators or in network functions, security encryption engines, network uh, processors, and in future, more efficient radio accelerators that then would be the, at, at the cloud. So think of this as really a heterogeneous compute platform. And on that compute platform, you create your 6G network uh, functions. I won't bother you with, with all the details, but the, the takeaway is that the network functions that are today dedicated boxes, in future, you create in software on that heterogeneous multi-cloud infrastructure. And then you have all the goodies that cloud native designs bring you. And underneath that, so this is actually one important research direction that we have at, at Bell Labs. The, the other one is then the interconnect of those data centers, the essential network fabric. So think mainly optical uh, transmission networks, optical metropolitan networks, and then also the routing infrastructure. And so, so also in those spaces, we, we have innovations going at the system level as well as at the optical device le level, new lasers, new detectors, and silicon photonics. But then it is important that this future is not only a multi-cloud, but also multiple networks, a network of networks. There will be the CSP, the communication service provider networks. There will be the data center networks. There will be satellite networks. The endpoints of the networks are again networks. <coughs> It can be a body area network, it can be a car area network, it can be an enterprise network. So you, you, you see the complexity. How, how do you provide a service across all these networks in a frictionless way? And so this is the third big area where we invest our research. How do you make that happen? And here AI comes to the rescue. I mentioned AI is going to be an important new compute capability that we will leverage for the next generation network. Well, here it comes to the rescue in the automation of, of that. And, and AI, when you say AI, you also say data. How do you store that data? How do you architect that data? How do you share that data across the different networks, across the different stakeholders also, because you need to collaborate between that web scale data center and, and the service provider and possibly an enterprise network. So what do you share, what do you don't, what do you not share? And do that in a secure way. Okay, so this is our vision of the future network and as I said, in these three pillars we have uh, important research investments at Bell Labs. Now, to be more specific, we said 6G, there must be six research vectors. Somehow, we, we made it fit. Uh, new spectrum technologies, so maybe terahertz, but also in the lower frequency bands, innovations in, in, in radio technologies. Second, using AI, but not only for that network orchestration in the fr frictionless network, the, the automation, but use AI at the air interface, can we make two endpoints, just figure out how they talk to each other, learn the channel, and get the most efficient uh, transmission? Radio will be all around us. Can we use that for other purposes than only communication? Radar, can we use it as a sensor? And then extreme connectivity, that is really to the point of this multiple networks and every type of network has different, more specific uh, requirements, specialized networks. A body area network, possibly, most likely, it's about energy efficiency. If I talk a machine area networks, it's, it's a lot about very low latency and high reliability. And then how do you architect that network altogether? So that multi-cloud environment, 
how does that architecture look uh, in detail? And last but not least, make that happen with security and trust. Now, I won't talk about every one of them, but I'll give you a few examples so you get a bit of feel of the type of research that, that we have. So new spectrum technologies. So you see here in the vertical axis the different frequency bands that we use today for uh, the generations up to 5G. So, and you see in the horizontal axis the, the reach. So as the frequency goes up, reach coverage uh, gets reduced. So uh, until LTE, 4G, most of the technology uh, covered the long reach, the, the low bands. 5G is very big on the mid band. You may have heard in the news about the C band because it was a bit tricky with the, the, the airlines, uh, 3.5 gigahertz. That is where the big uh, deployments and, on wideband uh, are today. When we started the research on 5G, we talked a lot about millimeter wave. That was the exciting new thing 10 years ago. Uh, lots of research and in, in investment. It didn't really pan out. Sometimes you make the wrong bet in the, in the research. Um, there is some deployment of millimeter wave by, by Verizon in hotspots like in, in, in New York. But the reason why it doesn't happen is, is because at scale is because of the limited reach. You need every 200 meters, you need a, a small cell. And that uh, becomes expensive. And it turns out that this mid-band, 3.5 gigahertz, is actually a very suited band to serve the, the needs of mobile users and also fixed wireless access users. So the question is then for 6G, what are the frequency bands that we should go after? And yes, millimeter wave, can we do the same excitement in research on even higher frequency? Absolutely interesting for PhD research. You will learn a lot, but we are still careful in saying this is the band for, for 6G. Now, this research is, is then not going to waste. It is an important band for backhaul. What is backhaul? It is instead of, if you don't have a fiber to a base station, you have a, a wireless connection to that base station that needs fiber-like speeds, very high capacity. And uh, we're using there such things as the, the, the W-band, the E-band, and we're investing in, in research in the D-band. But uncertain whether that is also going to happen in the access network because reach is very limited. So maybe it is more in confined spaces in enterprise applications. But then there is another interesting band that we go after, and that is just above the, the current mid-band, the 7 to 20 gigahertz. And we have already shown in simulations that if you look at the reach, you can do a pretty good job at getting the coverage from existing cell towers. If you can get same coverage from existing cell towers, that is the technology that will prevail. You don't need to roll out small cells. Lesson learned from 5G millimeter wave. Okay, so we're investing in research in these new bands. Uh, I'll start by talking a bit about distributed massive MIMO. So what, what is massive MIMO? MIMO is multiple in, multiple out. These are basically large antenna arrays, and thanks to these antenna arrays, you can actually have constructive interference in specific directions, beams in a way, ele electromagnetic beams, and you can have actually multiple at the same time. If, if you can confine the, the, the signal power, you get a very good signal to noise ratio, hence high capacity. So these invented at Bell Labs, massive MIMO, uh, going a step further is can you combine multiple antenna arrays on, on different towers of buildings and use them for the same handset and you can intuitively understand that you then even get higher resolution and higher capacity. So we have proven that this can be done. Uh, we actually made big news of it at, at an important conference for us, the Mobile World Congress. But this is already in 5G, 5G advanced. The, the, the reason why I mentioned it in a 6G talk is because it's a stepping stone for us to go to even larger antenna systems in that new band, the 7 to 20 gigahertz. 
And the, the way to achieve that high coverage from existing cell site is by going to even higher numbers of antennas in that array. Narrower beams, better signal to noise ratio. Now, it's helpful. So the, the antenna spacing of these antenna elements is half a wavelength. So it's very helpful that at double the frequency, you have half the wavelength. So in the same form factor, you have four times uh, the number of antennas. So that helps us. Uh, it still remains a challenge because you have four times more antennas, four times more power amplifiers, four times more signal processing. How do you do that in an energy efficient way? Because going forward to the future, sustainability becomes an important and has been all, uh, actually for radio for a while already an important constraint. Getting power to a cell site costs money. It's, it's a green solution if you have an energy efficient green also as in the, the color of money. Uh, you, you actually uh, reduce the deployment cost if you can get the energy done. So we have lots of research going on, on in, in that space. And then, so that is the 7 to 20 gigahertz. And then the other uh, is the, uh, the, what we call sub-terahertz or near-terahertz, that what we call D-band, 130 to 170 gigahertz, remember, above the millimeter wave band. And uh, one of the things that is a challenge is not only those RFICs, the radio frequency integrated circuits, but also how do you package these? The, you, you can no longer use the classical PCB materials, the epoxy materials. They're not no good for these type of, uh, in terms of losses, permittivity, and all that. Um, but glass turns out to be a very good uh, solution to etch uh, waveguides and uh, yeah, to package these RFICs and make antenna arrays and all that. So a lot of research in, in that uh, direction as well. Our medium-term application is backhaul, fiber-like speeds over the air. But then it's, it's also our insurance for if terahertz becomes important for the access, the connection to the end devices, we have the, the right assets as well. So that's about new spectrum technologies. Now about using for the radio interface AI in new ways. And here you have the classic design of a transmitter and a receiver with all its different elements, uh, the receiver you have your sync, channel estimation, equalization, symbol demapping, uh, decoder, all, the whole change. And there is already a lot of research going on in the, the research community on how you use machine learning for each one of these blocks. And we had the discussion uh, just after lunch with, with, with your faculty. We, we realize, yeah, you, a lot of information is actually lost at these interfaces. Wouldn't it be nice if you can keep that one pay, pipe and that you reuse the channel estimation to its full strength to then come to a better equalization, as an example? So as a first step, we, we already do that. Keep the, the chain whole, keep as much as possible information by treating that as one deep neural network as a receive function. And you can do that already in, in 5G. You don't need a feedback loop with 6G. And it's, it's not only improving the uh, performance. With that integrated approach, you can also think of possibly reducing complexity. Maybe you can reduce the number of layers in your machine learning network. So, but this, is, this actually doesn't require a new standard. This is inside the receiver box. If you, however, for a next generation mobile, create an, a new standard, you can start thinking of feedback loops between the end device and the radio base station. Uh, so, and then you can also start thinking of the two, of the transmitter being a deep uh, neural network, and the two endpoints indeed start learning the channel, case by case, situation by situation. And so we've done earlier research on that already. So here is a constellation self-learned by the two endpoints. You know the modulation schemes of amplitude and phase, and you have that classical quadrature amplitude modulation. It's a regular pattern, grid. Well, in this case, it's not that regular grid as you have in QAM modulation. It's self-learned. 
And it's different for the channel conditions. You see at the top the signal to noise ratio. So, but as we use these AI and trying to improve the performance of the radio, we're also touching on Shannon's limit. Shannon, Claude Shannon, another famous uh, Bell Labs researcher, who yeah, figured out there is a limit to the capacity uh, of a channel. And so using these new techniques and AI, we started, hey, let's have a fresh look at, at, at Shannon's theory. And there is a famous paper by Claude Shannon and his colleague Weaver. And in the introduction, Weaver writes, communication actually, there's three levels. There is level, the, the first level is the transmission of bits and symbols and do that with minimal error. The second level, however, the more interesting one is, do I convey the meaning in a proper way? When I talk to you, do you understand what I'm saying? Semantic communication. And the third is then uh, goal-oriented, effective communication. When I tell you, do this, have you received this at the other end, and are you indeed executing the goal that I told you? Now, Shannon famously said, hmm, conveying meaning and understanding, you know, that, that's a human problem. The real engineering problem is that bit transmission. And that's what we did for decades. But now the endpoints become machines. And if the, the understanding that machines have, that is part of the, of the engineering problem. Do these machines then execute on the goal that you have set? It becomes part of the engineering problem. So we, and I'll illustrate that with an example here. You have uh, the goal is identify the people that are in the view of a camera. And so what you do today to make that happen is you have a coding algorithm that extracts feature from that image. Those features will, will be transmitted over the system. And at the other end, you have a coding algorithm that compares that to a database and gives you the identity of the people in the image. And the transmission problem and the goal are treated as separate problems. And likely, you come to a suboptimal solution, especially if your channel is, is constrained. Imagine IoT, battery constraint, energy constraint, or, or transmission constraint. So a new way of thinking of this is why don't we combine that as a, as a single problem? And so this is an example where semantic communication and effective co communication, goal-oriented communication, becomes part of the engineering problem. And so at Bell Labs, we start looking at this in, in new ways and yeah, hopefully an exciting new area with new inventions. OK, using the network as a sensor. Already today in 5G, we, we can use a radio this is a 5G uh, radio that is used to localize the location of this robot. So you, you can see with angular of arrival, with the number of access points that you have in a factory floor, for this, time of arrival, combining that and with algorithms, you can actually fairly well track with the radio signal the, the path of that, of that robot. So now in 6G, we want to use that in, in different ways. We want to use radio as a radar. So here you still need an active signal. That, that robot has a, actually a, a UE, a user equipment 5G handset inside. So there's an active signal that we are tracking. In radar, you don't need an active signal. You just get the back reflection of a body, of a of that robot, and with some accuracy, and we are estimating about 10 centimeter accuracy, you can get the location. You can even get some shape. And then using Doppler, you can actually also get frequency movement, speed of movement, heartbeat. Maybe not to medical grade accuracy, but OK, it, that body is a human or breathing. Or there is a rotating fan. 
hmm, that body there is probably a piece of equipment with a characteristic fan rotation speed. Humans have a certain way of, of walking that you can actually identify the object. So there's interesting ways that you can use radio signals, and pun intended, the 6G network with the six sets, understanding what's happening by using that ubiquitous radio that is around us. Okay, I'll, I'll skip to the, the last topic, 6G security, and I introduce that by talking a little bit that uh, bragging actually that we have re uh, long-term research on quantum computing as the next big thing. Um, and the, the big challenge with qu uh, quantum qubits is to get them stable. So it's, uh, you, you have these two states, Schrodinger equations. You never know what state it is. They're, they're both present in the same thing. The, the, the cat of Schrodinger is alive and dead at the same time. So, but that is interesting because uh, you can actually do calculations you, considering these mu multiplicity of states because the, the states superimpose. One qubit, two states at the same time. Two qubits, four states at the same time. Three bits, it's three qubits, is eight qubits at the same time. And you see how that exponentially goes up. And you can do calculations treating all these possible combinations at the same time. That makes a quantum computer so powerful. But that qubit state, you only get at very, very low temperatures. Uh, we're talking about uh, 25 millikelvin, so really very close to the absolute zero. Cryogenic technology is needed, and that's why when you see pictures of a quantum computer, you likely see these artistic structures of plumbing structures of uh, Christmas trees. That's because you need to get, uh, yeah, your 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 interfaces to the qubit that is somewhere here at the center and, and cooled. And then you can start thinking of the, the gates as you have with, with digital electronics. So, but why do I use that uh, for an introduction to security? Well, a guy at Bell Labs, Peter Shore, figured out already uh, more than a decade ago, these are good tools to hack. S security code that today is deemed safe that you need centuries of compute power to hack, uh, say, the, the 2048 RSA code, you can hack in a couple of hours with a quantum computer. And that is because you have all these possible combinations in one compute cycle at the same time. And so you, you need 4,000 qubits for, for this code, and you have all possible combinations immediately tracked after a couple of hours you've hacked the code. So quantum computers, we expect, depending on whom you talk, is still 10 years out, but hey, there is data going around on the network, government security information. If you store that today, 10 years, you have that computer, you, you try to hack that, decrypt that, may still be secure information and relevant. So already today, we need to start thinking about encrypting data in a quantum safe way, and the encryption itself you can do with classical electronics. Decryption you can also do with classical electronics. It's the hacking that you need the quantum computer for. So, but, uh, so there's a, a whole stream of research in what is quantum safe encryption. But there's other security research beyond that. Zero trust. Uh, I mean, that, that future multi-cloud infrastructure that has components from different parts of the world, there are billions of devices connect to that source cannot be guaranteed. There's open source software in there. Where does that come from? So a zero trust infrastructure, but we want to create a trusted services on that multi-cloud infrastructure. So how do you do that? Anchors of trust using digit distributed ledgers, similar technologies as in crypto that you can do a check, can I trust that piece of software? Can I trust that piece of hardware? So there's, there's all kinds of things that we, we go after there. Privacy preservation. How do you exchange data with a partner, say for instance a web scaler and a communication service provider or an enterprise, without revealing information of individuals? Privacy pre preservation. And then AIML, secure AIML. AIML as a tool to detect anomalies, 
possible hacking behavior, but then also AI as a source of insecurities. People that embed yeah, unsecure data in trusted AI models. So you, get, you, you see where this is going. This is a new cat and mouse game that we need to understand better. Okay, I'm reaching the end. So what should you remember? 6G, we should go after new applications. That's the direction. The digital physical world fusion and how that enhances our productivity, digital twins of factories. Second, 6G, what is the new technology? Yes, new radio, but AI will be a new tool for automation for possible new air interfaces. And then that whole cloud-based infrastructure. And then, yeah, making it a trusted and quantum safe uh, infrastructure. Okay, with that, uh, thank you for the attention and open for questions. I have brownie points for the first icebreaker question. <laughs> brownie points are meaningless, but you get them anyway. You get it. Yeah, so, so when we create circuits today, uh, ICs, and you put them usually on, on classical PCB technologies, then you create waveguides that interconnect these radio frequencies, and yeah, they create losses uh, due to the materials uh, that do the waveguides that you have. Turns out, that glass is a better material f with a better epsilon and all that, more suited for those high frequencies. Um, and so, yeah, you can use this, you coat them again with, with, with conductors. Uh, you, you do the same etching processes as in PCB, but you can have tighter uh, devices with those RFICs on them. And, and the beauty is you can actually also create antennas with, with them. You, I don't know if you have seen a millimeter wave uh, radio system. I talked about these massive large scale antenna arrays. Uh, the size uh, in the mid band are wavelengths of say an inch or two. In millimeter wave, as the name says, the size of the antenna elements are millimeter wave. So you get in a very small form factor, a large scale antenna arrays. And in sub terahertz, you can actually create these arrays on glass. Is that? A bit answering your question. Yes. Okay. Good. All right. Now the ice is broken. Yes. Yeah. So this is a bit the the open mindset that we have as 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 researchers at Bell Labs, and I hope also in other research institutes and also here, that you always keep an open mind of, hey, it's behaving like this. What is this, and what can I use it for? We we even have at the entrance of of Bell Labs a quote by Graham Bell, yeah, walk your way, but also be ready to go off the track, the the un unwalked path, and. Uh, yeah, it leads to such inventions as these uh, solar cell or so. Um, keep an open eye on what you're seeing. Does that help? No. And as a manager, uh, allow for that as a, if you ever become a, a research manager. And that's not always easy because the manager is very output driven. You need to solve this problem for that. and then. Admittedly, you as a mature researcher should then make the judgment call. Do I have a little bit going on under the radar? <laughs> I see your smile. You, it, it probably resonates. We, we all have that. You, you should have a bit, few things on the back burner. And ultimately, yeah, sometimes you go and discover really big things. We have one saying, uh, sail for India and discover America. So you can apply that to, to other things as well. Sometimes research is a journey. You're discovering something, you go after something, but hey, actually here. And then have that agility to go for that. But don't fall in love with the technology. 
Is it a real problem? Has it been solved already? No? Okay. Has it been solved? Then it will not have the impact. The industry will not flip if it's already a solved problem. Unless it's 10 times cheaper or so, then, then yes. More questions? Yeah. So there are actually, and, and not only Bell Labs, there are already encryption schemes. Uh, NIST, uh, please say again? That are uh, provable quantum safe. Uh, there has actually been by uh, NIST, a, a standard association in, in the US, there has been a competition between universities to select a quantum safe uh, encryption. So that, that has already been uh, done and what our research now goes after is uh, what does that now mean for our systems? But then also, are there still smarter ways of doing it? That, uh, less compute intensive or, or so. And then other part of research is, yeah, a, a quantum computer is not only for hacking, it will have interesting applications. Uh, in the early phases, we expect few qubits, so it will be problems of few inputs, but many, many cal polynomial calculations, for instance. Longer term, when you have many, many inputs possible with millions of qubits, but that's still 20 years out, then there's such things as medicine, protein, simulations, and, and what have you. And we're keeping an eye on, on, the, on these, and, and also partnerships with, with Microsoft and, and IBM that are very big on this quantum computing. Yep, please. So, in a way, that AI air interface is a new way of thinking of cognitive radio, in a way. Ah, okay, yeah. So, so we do uh, look at that again uh, in a fresh way because there's a lot of spectrum not efficiently used, uh, white space or repurposing. So yes, we, we look at how do you flexibly use the available spectrum. And yes, does AI help us with, with figuring that out in, in, in real time? Uh, so this requires, of course, uh, cognitive radio is the question, and if you start using uh, unused spectrum, uh, how, do, uh, yeah, uh, how does that go with the regular, with the FCC? Uh, we, we also interact with the regulator, like here are concepts, change your regulation to make that happen. I mean, CBRS band is, is, is a classical example where that already happened. Right? Look, we found ways to make it compatible with uh, the incumbent user, Navy radio. Uh, we, we, let, we first sense whether there is an incumbent, and if not, then we have a way of, of enabling a 5G communication service. So that's an example of where we worked with the regulator to, 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 make it, to prove it, and then uh, a regulator saw the proof and said, yes, let's enable CBRS. And I see such things then also happen in, in, in 6G. Question. Yep, please. Is the 6G era dependent on the quantum computing era, or can we, like, are we assuming that they're going to be about around the same time? Good question. Uh, 6G network is not dependent on quantum computers. Uh, there may be other innovations in the radio, in cloud, in AI that make these next generation networks possible, or so applications. Quantum computing is just one thing that will happen around that same time, and we, so we need to be aware of it as a threat, but also as a possible opportunity. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Uh, when we had our earlier meeting, you, you were talking about having some of the compute, the neural networks and so forth, implemented in analog form. Yep. Can you maybe speak to that? 
Yeah. So, so when we imp when we are thinking of these uh, uh, radios with, with AI, if you do that the, the plain vanilla classical way, you you will be burning compute power. It it, it won't be as efficient as the, the the radios that we have with DSP today. I mean, it's ten times or more in power consumption. So that that is not solving a real world problem. But we need to think of the compute in new ways. And one direction is be smarter about the architectures. Compute in memory is a direction where we uh, put the, yeah, the compute close to the memory so that you, you don't have the energy of transfer between compute chip and memory chip. But then in the compute in memory, you can do some of the calculations, the multiplications or the, the sums and, and yeah, vector processors and, and AI is very often sums and, and of weight factors and, and multiplications. Do that in the analog domain. And then when you say analog computing, oh my God, you need high linearity. Isn't that, hmm. That's counter to energy efficiency because high linearity usually means high supply, supply volumes to get to the linearity. Well, it turns out that you can live with non-linearities in, in uh, neural networks. The, the insight is you're actually cor correcting for a very noisy channel. Just treat those imperfections in your neural network at the same time. So the, these neural networks seem to be self-correcting also for the imperfections of your analog compute. And knowing that, we can get actually to an order of magnitude lower compute power for our, our AI. And so that's why we are strengthened in the belief, yes, we can make these AI air interfaces work. Yeah, thanks for the question. Okay. All right, then thanks again for your attention and I hope to see you again.